Gospel of Mark, verses 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and pleaded with him repeatedly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And so he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately her flow of blood stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the synagogue leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, do not be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow, follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talithakum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Word of God, word of life. Yes, this is a beautiful passage. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love this scripture. I'm, I'm a word nerd, and uh, you know, I was the artist in residence at Luther Seminary, and I always love learning about uh, the history and culture of, of the text, and particularly the words, right, the, what the words mean. And so Dave and I were talking about how the, one of the words used in this passage is therapeos, right? And that's where we get our word therapy, but it meant a uh, healing touch, right? A healing touch that not only heals the body, but actually is more about the, the restoring of community, the healing back into community. So it's referring to this healing touch of Christ in this passage. And as I was reflecting, I was thinking about when did I need that healing touch of Christ in my life where I needed to be restored back to community. There's been many times, one of, the, one of the heaviest times I can recall was at the beginning of the pandemic where we were all cooped up in our, in our places of residence, in our, in our houses, apartments, and I'm, I'm a full-time artist, and so I didn't have any gigs to go to. Everything was canceled. Everything was shut down. I was in my home, and I was, I was kind of freaking out. I remember I was like pacing around. I was binge watching Netflix. I was trying to distract myself. I was on my phone, doom scrolling, looking at the news. Or I always say they shouldn't even call it the news. They should just call it the worst things that are happening near you. Because that's what it felt like. We were just inundated with so much negativity and so much heaviness. I really felt it in my body, in my spirit. I didn't know what to do. And I, I just sat on the edge of my bed. And I began to, to cover my, my chest with the palm of my hand. And I felt like this racing of my heart and, and this, this rattling of my nervous system. And I was like, wow, I'm carrying so much. And the more I listened to my body and my spirit, I, I felt that there was a lot of 
anxiety and depression. I was holding this, this collective grief, this collective trauma. And then when I touched, touched my heart with the palm of my hand, I felt like I wanted to cry. And I didn't really want to cry because, you know, growing up, especially as, as a boy, you know, we were taught like, oh, you're not supposed to cry. You're supposed to be tough, you're supposed to be strong, keep it all together. But I learned later on that that's not very healthy. Emotions aren't meant to be repressed but expressed. And in that moment, I felt like there was a still small voice just speaking to me and saying, just let go. And I began to cry right there on the edge of my bed. And it wasn't just like a little, little, little couple of tears, one, one tear going down my cheek. It was like snot bubbles, and I was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. But I know that Christ was there in that moment. I felt, even though it was just me and I put my hand on my chest, I felt the presence of Christ right there in my room. And things didn't magically get better, but I knew that I wasn't alone. And it wasn't too long after that that I started to see how we were all restoring ourselves to community. There was new ways to be the church together beyond the four walls because we couldn't come to the physical building. But we started to realize how Christ is with us wherever we are, how we can still build community. We can still connect and love and support and uplift each other. And that was profoundly transformative for me to see that and to feel that. What I didn't know is that even just putting the, your, your, your hand on your chest, that actually regulates your central nervous system, right? And there was all these new and creative ways that we found to reach out to each other and to build community and to be the church, to offer that therapeos, that healing touch. It can manifest in so many different ways beyond what we can previously imagine. And that was an experience that really taught me that, and I'm really grateful for that. How did you experience the therapeos, the healing touch of Christ? Well, first of all, I think... I want to teach these people the way that you and I usually affirm people during workshops because I want to affirm you with it. So we always say after somebody shares vulnerably, we always say, beloved child of God, you matter. So I think we should say that to Joe. Joe, beloved child of God, you matter. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing that. Um, and, and I can share my story of, of Theropeos. As you, uh, Theropeo. as you mentioned, I have a lot of them. <laughs> um, but I, I had a similar situation um, it, during the pandemic. It was a rough time for me as well. Uh, I was trying to raise a couple of neurospicy kids and, and homeschool them, and that was not going very well. Um, my my mother-in-law passed away. There was a lot going on in our lives. And, uh, and so my friend that I've known since I was eight years old, I uh, went over to his house, and I hadn't gotten a lot of human contact with anybody really, but this was one of the first chances I had. And I'm in his basement, and he said, and I'm, I'm struggling. And I'm complaining about something. He says, well, I mean, you know, you have been depressed for the last four months. And I said, what are you talking about? I had never, ever resonated with the D word ever in my life. But when he named it, I identified it in my life. And he put his hand on my shoulder. And similar to Joe, I, I began to weep. And I began to weep and weep. This is somebody who's known me so long. And when somebody who knows you so well is able to lay hands on you and bring that, that healing touch uh, and restore you back to yourself and back to community. Uh, it has a power. And I think the people in this story, uh, in a few of these stories today, they knew that. They knew that Jesus offered something. And, and they were so desperate. Jairus was saying, I, I, I just, I need something. God, can you help me? And I, those of us who have uh, children know what it's like to just want to help your kids and not know how to do it and just feel helpless. And so they, they say, Jesus, please. Can you, can, you, can you heal my daughter? Can you, can you touch my daughter with your theropeo? And then we have this hemorrhaging woman. Now, some of you know a little bit about, um, about the law and what it says about, you know, touching uh, women who are bleeding. And, you know, there were different teachings about this, right? So we don't want to make a monolith out of ancient Jewish culture. But there was at least a few folks who believed both that, um, that we, don't, we don't touch um, folks who are bleeding and we also, um, we, we also it, those who are afflicted, they, they really saw it as an affliction or as a curse. Like you're, you're, you didn't, your faith wasn't strong enough or you just didn't quite believe enough. If you just would believe a little bit more and, you know, um, or if you were just behaved a little bit better, you wouldn't be cursed with this sickness. And, and Jesus puts that to rest because he says to the hemorrhaging woman, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. So those who have alienated you, those who have ostracized you um, because they didn't want to touch you, because they were doing the right thing, your faith has made you well. You are part of this community. You belong here. Um, and I think for, for many of us, we come to Jesus, desperate some of us, 
and, and we lay there and, and, and we, have, we, we lay our lives before Jesus, just like a, a, a parent laying a baby before Jesus and saying, do something. God, I can't, I can't manage this anymore. I can't manage this addiction anymore. I can't, I, 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 I'm looking at this world and I'm saying, do something, please. And, and Jesus says, oh, see that? Your addiction, it's not dead. Or your sobriety, it's not dead. It's just sleeping. That world that you long for of peace and justice where mothers aren't crying for their babies anymore, it's not dead, it's just sleeping. And he points, I imagine that he points to his sides where the wounds are of his life, death, and resurrection and says, whom, rise up. You are my people, you are loved just as you are. That idealized self that you have that's worthy of God's love, the one that always recycles, that never swears, that always behaves perfectly. I don't need that self. I need the self that you are right in this moment. Come just as you are. All are welcome. Come as you are. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So we're going to sing this song together, and I hope that this will speak to both to those of us who have done some of that cutting off of other people, but also to those parts of ourselves that have been marginalized. And may this word speak into that today and tell you that you are loved just as you are. Look to somebody next to you and say, you are loved. You are loved. Just as you are. Just as you are. Amen.